So ours is a profoundly sacred story um, and to really appreciate the significance today of our place in the universe and our place in the planet we will realize and reclaim um, those links and those connections if we also have a complementary spirituality and theology to do that and my way of accessing all that is to revisit the anthropology our sacred human story and I think there we get material that is incredibly rich and profound for the deeper integration of who we are and what we are as a sacred species. Teher de Chardin is a name that needs little introduction and he said, and this is a well-known quotation of his, some day after we have mastered the winds, the waves, the tides and gravities, we shall harness for God the energies of love. And then, for the second time in history, the history of the world, humanity would have discovered fire. Was the first discovery of fire not also about love? And indeed, the second discovery of fire was also of huge, momentous significance. So we think that fire was first discovered in the sense of it being mastered about one million years ago. And there are three items usually put together in the literature um, around the discovery of fire. It's linked often in with the hunting and then with the um, ability now to be able to cook the meat and cook the food and therefore making it more digestible. But with the, putting these three features together also creates some rather serious problems. Um, back in the mid-1960s at a conference in Chicago entitled Man the Hunter, there was evidence shown of a number of skulls from southern Africa with holes in them. And this was presented as evidence for human violence. The argument basically being that being a hunting species, of course there are times where we will be violent and this violence is almost a necessary even so this um, uh, title man the hunter was actually the title of a conference in Chicago back in the 1960s and at that conference they showed a number of skulls with holes in them the holes being evidence they were claiming for human violence and part of the argument throughout the conference was Yes, we are a violent species, in a sense we need to be. This is an evolutionary adaptation that has been necessary both for our survival and for our thriving. However, some years later, and I don't have the exact details of this one, they re-examined those skulls, noting that several of the holes were of the same size, whereas a lot of the spears and daggers they would have used would be of different size. And then perchance somebody measured the beak of one of these big birds of prey and noted that it was very similar to the size of several of the holes in the skulls. So instead of man the hunter, researchers began talking about man the hunted. That indeed many of those holes in all probability had nothing to do with human violence but had to do with humans being attacked by these big birds of prey and that began to shift the whole debate and led to much deeper research around this feature of human violence. Now this book um, which is entitled Man the Hunted is by Donna Hart and her professor Robert Sussman. It was published in the early years of the 21st century. It's her PhD um, dissertation turned into book for him. Um, this is a very controversial book and controversial still among some of the scholars but it's showing another orientation, another side that really does require a lot of attention and more so as we look at things like the atonement theory for example in the, in, in the case of our Christian story and all the emphasis put on suffering as a good quality and a good thing 
that we have done over the years in our Christian spirituality. Basically, what this book amounts to is that there is no substantial scientific evidence for hunting for meat before 150,000 years ago. So 7 million years we've been around and go back past 150,000 years ago we were primarily a horticultural species rather than a hunting species. And then in the conclusion of the book uh, they throw out an enormous challenge to the rest of the scientific community that if we can come up with substantial evidence to show that there was extensive hunting before 15,000 years ago they claim that we probably won't find it. So this whole idea of being a violent species is based on a vast number of assumptions that need to be radically re-evaluated. The same with this other book, The Man-Eating Myth, that we were a cannibalistic species. The evidence for that is meagre, to say the least. Therefore, in the conclusion to the book, Hart and Sussman conclude, we humans are not slaughter-prone assassins by nature. That turns the tables on several of the assumptions that Christianity and indeed every religion has been working with for many years. Then there's a range of other supplementary evidences come in. So Sarah Hardy Blafford, or Sarah Blafford Hardy, is a primatologist looking at the patterns of bonding that go on not merely in the human species but in a range of other primate species as well. All leaving us with a deep inner imprint for bonding, for affection, for connection, not for violence. And this book by Jeremy Rifkin, which again is a fairly thoroughly researched one, The Empathic Civilization, that we as a species are programmed primarily for empathy, not for violence. This is very countercultural material, bearing in mind that we do live in a very violent world today. And yet, coming exactly out of that world, over the past 10 to 15 years, I've come across 10 major bits of work along these lines, taking this very different alternative approach. We now come to language. Um, so language as we know it today is usually dated to about 100,000 years ago. For a long time before that there was what they called proto-language. And even a lot of the chimps and others, uh, other creatures that share the planet with us um, have been able to build a repertoire of sounds and ways of communicating through sound um, over several um, millions of years. Um, however, language in the more um, proper sense is a much more re recent uh, um, acquisition. This uh, man, Terence Deacon, is a neuro neurolinguistic scientist and tends to take a rather different approach from the majority of scholars. So for the majority of scholars, language is such a highly sophisticated set of skills um, that it is only after language they claim that we humans develop the ability for symbolism, that we have developed the ability for abstract thinking, that we developed all those other skills and abilities that belong more fully to the human person. Terence Deacon tends to take the opposite approach. He says when you look at language, it is a highly complex phenomenon that could only have been evolved and developed by a highly complex species. And therefore, it's because we were already internalizing the power of symbolism, the power of abstraction, the power of imagination, that then we were able to give birth to language. And to me, at least, that sounds like a much more compelling um, approach. However, when it comes to language, I really like the approach of David Abram from this book, The Spell of the Sensuous. And this is how he explains and approaches it. Being creatures deeply immersed in nature and always absorbing and taking in the sounds of nature, the whooshing of wind in the trees, the gurgling sound of the streams, the sea waters washing over the sand, the cracking of thunder, singing of the birds, 
the bellowing of the animals, all these sounds collecting within us reached a new evolutionary threshold whereby we too began emitting or giving forth sound. In other words, that we learned to make sound through our close affiliation with nature, being fundamentally creatures of nature. And this is another major strand um, in our evolutionary story. We are earthlings, we belong to the earth, the closer we remain to it, the more authentic and integrated and fulfilled we will be, not merely as human beings, I argue, but as spiritual creatures as well. We come therefore to spirituality. Um, the evidence for this, again, um, is usually cited at about 70,000 years ago. Um, in the ancient burial rites done by the Neanderthals and other of our ancient ancestors in which they were using a lot of elaborate rituals um, long before priests or churches or religions were ever heard of. The two images you have here, um, the, these are the pyramids of Egypt, which of course are very recent. And then we have this image of the great Earth Mother Goddess, which we believe was an understanding of God, or of divine spirit that we had, certainly going back into Paleolithic times, 40,000 years ago, 50,000 years ago, I suspect much more ancient than that. Now, uh, much of the evidence on which these assumptions are based are Ice Age art. And Ice Age art is usually dated between 30 to 40,000 years ago. And as the research goes on, we're moving up now into 40 to 45,000 years ago. Initially discovered in, Spain, in, in France, um, and in some of the caves of northern Spain. Um, it, many of the images are, are about animals, but there's a range of other motifs that are used as well. Then these statuettes were also found in several of the early sites, known as the Venus statuettes, and the interpretation usually is that they have something to do with the worship of the great goddess. Um, around in more recent years, they have made similar discoveries um, among the sand bushmen of South Africa with their rock paintings. Um, and then in, in around 2014 and since then, they have made similar discoveries um, in Indonesia, particularly these imprint of hands on the, on the walls of caves, which we also find in Europe and which we have found in Africa. Um, and this is dated around um, 40,000 years as well. In other words, all over the inhabited planet of the time, we humans were into this highly creative vein. Again, where's the evidence for the fundamental flaw is the question we have got to face here. And as we get deeper into this, and in the thorough research going on around it today, I, I, an emerging consensus today um, is that many of these caves, we believe, were possibly used by shamans for shamanistic rituals, because that was the leading spirituality of the time. Connected with a very strong creative vein, and very much grounded in the, in the belly of the earth itself, which the caves uh, represent. I had the privilege um, in 2019 of visiting some of those caves in northern Spain, and these are some of the images that I brought back with me. Um, the feeling I had walking through them is that one was going through something like a, a cathedral. Um, and even the ceilings were incredibly ornate, and they're not painted at all by humans, they're just the natural uh, structure of the caves themselves. The latest dating on some of these caves is 42 to 43,000 years ago. Now, in the pushing back then of the dates, we come to the Blombos Caves in Lesotho, in the eastern part of South Africa, and these are dated at somewhere between 75,000 years ago and 90,000 years ago. This is a different kind of art, but it's another artistic expression. It's shells uh, painted and colored and worn as necklaces, uh, seems to have been the, the custom. And then we come to this amazing date of 164,000 years ago, which is for, is for Pinnacle Point um, in the southern coast of South Africa, from research that was done back in 2008. So you see how the dates are being pushed back all the time as we gather more evidence 
and that's what's been summarized in this quotation by this man Augustine Fuentes in his summary. We tend to think of these beautiful cave paintings of the big mastodons and the wild oryx as art. But that's only about 40,000 years old, he says. We know that 85,000 years ago, in southern Africa, our ancestors were carving on ostrich eggshells and often made, turning them into uh, more, more, uh, objects that could be worn, like necklaces, for example. 20,000 years earlier, which would be 105,000 years than that, they were drilling holes in small shells and wearing them around their necks. 100,000 years before that, they were crumbling ochre and rubbing it on their bodies and using it for the rituals of the burial of the dead. 500,000 years before that, which is half a million years ago, they were making tools that were incredibly beautiful and more symmetrical and aesthetic than they had to be to do their jobs. Art is very deep in human history. And with that depth, we're touching into soul, we're touching into sacredness of a very profound nature, it seems to me. Um, then we come back, so this picture may give you the impression that this guy is trying to pass away at the time of day, banging two stones off each other. No, he's not. He's trying to create a piece of creative work. And he's doing it stone to stone. So this is the most recent um, information we now have. Stone technology appears to have emerged in the eastern Rift Valley about 2.6 million years ago. At this time, tools of the Oma industrial complex appeared, in which early human tool makers chose a durable crystalline stone. You see, they chose it. In other words, they were using faculties of reason, um, of choice, of rationality, of creativity, which, according to the majority of, of theorists, we only uh, could have those capacities after language. That theory won't stand up anymore because we see it at work here in the more creative vein. Meanwhile, in 2015, in this site, um, which is in the Turkana region, um, they made the new discoveries which now put the date for this artistic stonework to 3.3 million years ago. And that's the oldest date we have. And that then is usually the date we use for the creature that was around at that time was definitely Homo rather than Australopithecus. Uh, with indeed many, if not all, the kind of faculties that we have today. But obviously out of a different consciousness because it was a different time. This gentleman, um, Dietrich Stout, is Professor of Anthropology in Emory University in Atlanta, Georgia. And the picture is not very clear, but he's, he's in his laboratory in the university, and he's, the ground is covered in stone. A lot of that stone has been imported from East Africa. And he has a stone hammer and another piece of stone, and he's doing what's known as napping, K-N-A-P-P-I-N-G. In the experimental context with which he works, um, his, 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 his co-workers, when they're doing this, they get rigged up with electrodes so that we can observe what's happening in the brain as they're doing this work. And they're only allowed to use stone with stone. And they're not allowed to use hammers or chisels or anything like that. And their aim is to try and create an artistic object like you can see on the picture. Initially, the research, the brain research shows a lot of, of boredom, if you like, and the symptoms of boredom. But as they get more deeply into it, what the brain research shows are what's being activated in the brain are very high levels of creativity. Indicating that that was, if you like, the default position out of, we, out of which we humans have been acting and behaving for these several years. And then what I have on the list 
are, are some of the major findings culminating in the most recent date of 3.3 million years ago in which we developed the capacity for stonework. Moving on, we then come to our own time where things begin to change and it's not entirely clear what caused this change. Uh, the so-called agricultural revolution, which began about 10,000 years ago. Weather was a big factor, no doubt about that. And there may have been some other factors that we're not entirely clear about as yet. There was also a major shift in consciousness. And all these major shifts in consciousness will have light and darkness in them. We're more aware of this one because it's much closer to our time. It's not the first time, I suspect, that we had a major shift in consciousness as a species. And one day, hopefully, we'll begin to understand earlier ones as well. What went wrong and how we set it right again. And that would be valuable information for our time where we are clearly now operating in a way that is not congenial for the good of the planet or for the good of ourselves. So, we have been working with the land as a species for thousands upon thousands of years. But about 10,000 years ago was this new shift which is called the agricultural revolution. But it's, it, should be, it would be better to call it the manipulation and commodification of land. And the production of, of animals for food on a whole new commercial scale unheard of before that time when we were essentially hunter-gatherers. Now, the, 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 of the writers that I have consulted on this, the man I find most um, important and that seems to speak to the deeper truth of it is uh, Steve Taylor. And this book, The Fall, is a really good read in this material. He claims that the fuller impact of the so-called agricultural revolution did not actually happen in Europe, but happened in North Africa and right into Saudi Arabia. Up to about eight or nine thousand years ago, this was a highly fertile plain, what he calls Sahara Asia. Then came the major ice caps down through Europe, down over it, turning it into the Sahara Desert and the Arabian Desert that we know today. And with that movement, which probably took decades or maybe a few hundred years, there was huge dislocation and displacement of human beings and their resources, including their animals. Out of that crisis came a new movement, which today we call the power of patriarchy. A new masculine uh, movement towards domination, control, and the modification of the land. That really is what the agricultural revolution is about. It's not about the responsible creative use of the soil for producing food and so forth. It's this manipulation of the land, turning it into an object, turning it into a commodity, um, with a lot of the consequences that continue to our own time. Following on that are three outstanding personalities. Now this becomes important, uh, particularly for Christian religion. There are kings, which we think have been around for a long time, but in fact they are unheard of before about 7,000 years ago. There are warriors on horseback, very closely aligned with the king, and there are priests offering sacrifice in very close conjunction with the king. In the, in the temple in Jerusalem, in the Jewish religion, it's the king that was in charge, not the high priest. And for some of the special celebrations, where he had to, to wear special vestments, those vestments were not kept in the temple. They were kept in the king's palace. And so this quotation from John Dominic Crossan, it's now we begin to see violence coming into the whole scene. Not earlier on, as, as has long been claimed. Empire, particularly with the leadership and governance of kings, is the normalcy of civilization's violence. If you oppose empire as such, you are taking on what has been the normalcy of civilization's brutality for at least the last 6,000 years. So th this is our deep shadow in terms of the evolutionary phase that we are still going through and which I believe is now moving on the downward curve. I think this is the evolutionary epoch 
that's coming to an end, but with, with huge reaction and with a lot of confusion. Um, and how do we move on to reclaiming uh, that more congruent, organic interrelationship with creation that we have known for most of our time on Earth is obviously the perennial question for this time. Um, so here's just a few figures. Um, the whole notion of empire, which again when we read the Hebrew scriptures and often the history of Christianity and the, the, the relationship of Jesus with King David, we think this imperial side has been there for a long time. The oldest evidence we have for an empire is the Akkadian Empire of, of Sargon, uh, present day Mesopotamia, which is 4,4250 of the Christian era. Um, the first major Persian one is 2,500 years. There's an extra figure there, by the way, that shouldn't be there. That should be 4425. Um, 2000 is the first Chinese one and then uh, in India 1690 years ago. So the whole notion of empire, empire building and understanding religion through the context of kingship is a very recent historical development. Two words that um, that we just, well, one word we need to be aware of is this word civilization, um, which we, t we usually hear in a very positive vein, but in fact it very much belongs to this cultural background, which again I suggest we need to be aware of. Um, the Romans engaged in a constant battle to denigrate peoples who lived closer to the earth, labeling them as barbarians or savages, and by definition uncivilized. As with people, so with the earth. Both are raw material that can be shaped to serve civilization. And so civilization is nearly always associated with writing and the building of the first cities. Writing in the ancient Sumerian culture. And whereas these were organic developments with positive sides to them, and um, insofar as they're part of this package, they have a lot to do with trying to control and manage people. Um, and, and it was a necessary part of the emerging organization, but it also had this shadow side to it of patriarchal power and domination. We come to the great world of religions, beginning with Hinduism, or 5,000 years ago. Yeah, all the religions have a deep positive side to them, as we see in the Golden Rule, which is there in every major religion. But we can't get away from the fact that the religions as we know them today emerged under the shadow of the agricultural revolution. Under the shadow of patriarchy, the shadow of patriarchal power, the shadow of violence, the shadow of the disregard for the earth. And these are all some of the correctives we now need to make in a meaningful faith for our time. Which is basically what's being said here in this quote from um, uh, Johnson & Johnson in a recent book on spirituality. Each of the world's axial religions, the great religions, arose within the behavior patterns of the ancient totalitarian epoch, the time of empire building, within the still oppressive context of nearly 40 centuries of tyranny. Their magic mythic lens then evolved into the subsequent rational age. The question now is whether the religions can outgrow the behavior typifying their origin and move into the integration and holistic relationship that's supportive of the planet and of our place in the planet as earthlings. Moving towards the end, this beautiful quotation from Philip Hefner summarizes it all and in a sense helps us to see the importance of looking at ourselves as people of faith through the lens of this great story. It's God's story, it's our story, it's a very sacred story. Human beings are God's created co-creators whose purpose is to be the agency acting in freedom to birth the future that is most wholesome for the nature that has birthed us. The nature that is not only our genetic heritage but also the entire human community and the evolutionary 
and ecological reality in which we belong. And we belong to it. We were never intended to be the masters of it. And how to reclaim that sense of belonging is a major part of the challenge. Exercising this agency, an agency of belonging as earthlings to our ecological foundations within, within the living earth, exercising this agency is said to be God's will for humans. Very profound words and good words on which to bring the presentation towards its end. And for further reading, these are some of my own books and there's a range of other bits of material. And Ancestral Grace covers the seven million year story. Incarnation and New Evolutionary Threshold is where I outline the challenges of having to redefine and almost draw up a totally new theology of what we mean by incarnation. Not confining it just to the historical person of Jesus, but seeing it in the God who is embodied and at work with us throughout the entire seven million years. And then moving beyond original sin with the subtitle, Recovering Humanity's Creative Urge. That is the challenge facing us all at this time.